We tend to envision the world as divided between large continental economies, the United States, or perhaps even America, uh, Europe, Asia, the rising Asia, and so on and so forth. But in fact, in Africa, there is another continent out there, if you look at the data. And that continent is called the offshore world. It's the size of the continent in the sense that when we looked at the figures, the estimated figures of, of, uh, of assets that are registered through this world of offshore, we're looking at the figures now of 25, 30 trillion dollars. So this is a very large economic, in a sense, uh, uh, continent. And that's changed completely, I think, the way we should think about international trade, finance, wealth, and the way the world economy operates. It operates through this particular world called offshore world. Uh, the figure of 25, 30 trillion dollars is not my figure. I don't know how to count till three. It's a figure that a friend of ours called Jim Henry, who was the chief economist at McKinsey, came up with on the basis of various triangulation of different data. And that's the figure that many people, for example, in the Digital Network, believe it's probably closer to the truth than any other figure. What does it mean? Well, the figures that he came up with is 25 to 30 trillion dollars. Out of it, more than nine trillion dollars, he estimates, have escaped uh, countries which you call middle and low income countries. So actually, most of the funds from the offshore world are from the north, you may call to the north, but, uh, but there's a serious figures also from, of course, developing countries. Nine and a half trillion dollars, ten trillion dollars, it's a serious money. Other research showed that, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, and there were two separate research, showed that in the last 30 years, Sub-Saharan Africa collectively has lost about $1 trillion uh, in money. That, in fact, Sub-Saharan Africa is losing capital, not gained capital, is, in fact, funding the world out there. And the same evidence appears in other countries as well. Okay? So that's very significant. What does it mean? that so much money effectively is directed from developing country to develop. Well, m most obviously, these countries are starved of necessary resources, and I think that's what most people will focus on. Um, it's expensive to run the modern states. It's very expensive. Um, states that are particularly successful in today's world, and these are states that are successful in terms of GDP per capita and so on and so forth, like Scandinavian states, are extremely successful. Extremely expensive, and that's why they actually uh, taxation is quite high in this country. These countries, many of these countries, particularly what we call fragile states, of course, lack basic capital. Money is simply for investment. They rely on investment from the World Bank, they rely on health, but in fact, and that's the paradox of the thing, that they are exporters, capital exporters at the same time. So we have a problem, and we have a serious problem. But that's a, that's a quantitative problem, which is very serious, and I don't want to, under, to un, un, understate it, but it's only part of the issue that these countries actually encounter. Because the other problem, and that's difficult to quantify, it's qualitative. And that's to do with the nature of the relationship between government and the people within this country that evolve in the conditions where so much money, so many resources, find themselves are being, uh, uh, um, are being taken out of these countries. And it's, it, in, 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 when we talk about developing countries, it's really a matter of what are the resources. If we have raw materials, country which is rich in raw materials, there'll be a lot of capital flight. Countries which are poor, there'll be less, but most of them, all of them are losing money. When the elite in these countries have the ability to take so much money out, when their wealth, when their future, when their business position are basically linked to a world out there running through offshore, they don't need to negotiate with their own population. The negotiation with their own population takes the form of what we call patrimonial relationship. Those people who want to be part of that particular business, uh, uh, the business environment have to find more personal relationship based on either personal relationship or uh, ethnic relationship, relationship to a particular group or people in power. And what we don't have is the emergence of what we saw in Europe, which took a long time. So negotiation between government and people. The development of institutions. One minute, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> development of those institutional governance, governance that we associate with developing countries, which have been very successful. The third aspect is also more pernicious. And that aspect is that in many countries, when they are facing, and I need to take two more minutes, I think, John, when these countries facing or engaging with a very vi with a viable, sophisticated financial center like Cayman Island or Singapore, say, say near Thailand, what you'll find it is in a case like Thailand, it has difficulties developing its own financial center. It relies on Singapore. And as a result is, you'll find that it's very difficult to raise money in Thailand or in many of these countries, very difficult. They always have to go through offshore. And middle-sized middle businesses, small businesses have difficulties raising funds. There's no money in these countries. They have to raise funds normally through personal relationship, personal contact. Again, it reinforces the patrimonial system. Now, I guess I want to talk about the solution, but I don't think uh, I have time for that, do I? What are points? I have. The, 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 of course, the offshore world and tech sevens are now very, very, you know, there's much talk about them. But the pro proposals are being now discussed, and I think many of them are quite serious, um, will not address issue of development. And the reason, the reason are two. The proposals that are being now proposed are basically for countries, the proposals are for countries, say, like Britain and France, to be able to engage with the country or with jurisdiction like Cayman Island and others to, in order to find information about certain uh, companies, or, okay? So it's between states. It's an interstate relationship, and that's what, for example, the OECD is proposing. That's one principle that is being set on table. The problem with the countries, and you hear about Yemen in a moment, is of course, it's the government. The government is very unlikely to investigate itself. Okay? So the system of regulation that now is being proposed based on intergovernmental relationship is not going to work. The second principle that now I think becoming even more significant, I call it the NIMB principle, not in my backyard. Basically, the United States, Europe, and Japan are saying, um, you can set up companies, you can move to offshore wherever you like, but not in my backyard. If you want to invest in the United States or Europe, you have to follow my own rules. And they, or China, China, of course, does that. But I'm afraid developing countries will not have the power to impose that particular principle from NIMBY. So I think they are left between the cracks. And I think the situation that they are facing is quite grim at the moment. Uh, I tend to be uh, an optimist, generally speaking. But from this perspective, the situation doesn't look that particularly promising. I'll start by just giving you a little bit of detail about um, human development indicators in Yemen and the structure of politics. Um, and then I'll talk about the transition that Yemen is going through um, as a result of the Arab Spring uprising. And I'll try and link it into what we've just heard from Ronan about um, patterns of capital flight and the impact that they have on state building processes. Um, so Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East. And Yemenis, especially Yemeni children, are amongst the hungriest people in the world. Nearly half the population don't have enough food to eat, according to the latest statistics from the World Food Programme. Uh, Yemen is highly dependent on oil, but oil is running out. The country went past peak oil in 2002, and it's now producing less than half of what it was producing in 2002. And at the moment, there's no viable alternative to fill the gap in the state budget. Um, before the Arab Spring uprising in 2011, there was a civil war um, that had been going on for six years in the north. There was a southern separatist movement, and al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was considered to be one of the greatest threats to national security in the United States and other Western democracies. Yemen has a very weak state structure and a highly factionalized elite. And the army was not really run as a state institution at all. It was run as a series of personal fiefdoms. In 2011, when young people came onto the streets in Yemen to protest against corruption, the army divided and the regime basically, the elite families divided between themselves. Um, and one group uh, came to protect the protest camp and tried to position themselves as defenders of the revolution. Essentially, the uprising provided a catalyst that created a split inside the regime that was on the horizon already before the uprising. Now, that uneasy truce between rival elite factions um, has been holding since 2011 as a result of international mediation. Um, so the, the international community, particularly the UN, the British government, the US, the EU, have been trying to bring new political actors in Yemen into the political framework under their supervision. That means um, women, young people, some of the marginalized political groups and identity groups, 
that really didn't have very much access to the patterns of patronage that Ronan had described in his own presentation. We also see a caretaker president who is trying to oversee military restructuring in an attempt to bring the army under state control for the first time in Yemen's history. Um, a national dialogue, uh, which is one of the most, what well, is the most inclusive body in Yemen's history. Um, as I said, with um, young, young people and youth taking part in, in the discussions. And when the na national dialogue reaches its conclusion, hopefully in a matter of weeks, um, the country is going to go through a process of constitutional reform before moving towards elections. Now, in theory, that transition period was only meant to take two years, and the elections would happen in February 2014. Um, it looks like the transitional period is going to be extended. But the crucial thing to understand is that although there's this enormous potential now for progressive change in Yemen's formal political structures, when you look at Yemen's political economy, you see a rather different picture altogether. So under Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was president in Yemen for over 30 years, the political economy was built around an elite group of army commanders, tribal leaders, elite political figures, and business people. And this, this group was held together through marriage and patronage. Um, around 10 key families and business groups controlled more than 80% of Yemen's imports, manufacturing, processing, banking, telecoms, and transport, and pretty much the commodity supply chain that keeps Yemeni householders in food, water, and gas um, is really controlled by this kind of small group of families. Now, this informal network, which constituted the regime, was much more powerful than formal government structures um, before the uprising in 2011. And when the street, when the protesters came onto the street and the elite divided, these different factions and different family groups drew on their own personal resources in order to confront one another. Um, and in order to support their own, uh, really to kind of provide resources for their own supporters on the streets and within the political structure. But they kind of hit stalemate before the end of the year because they were quite evenly matched and they were starting to run out of money. Um, and in accepting the terms of the transition deal, including immunity for the former president, they basically came to an agreement amongst themselves that they would initially preserve their common advantage, at least whilst the longer-term discussions were going on about the structure of the state and formal political change. And our research shows that so far, the substructure of the old regime really remains in place, largely in place, with all evidence pointing to a kind of rebalancing of resources within the elite, rather than any radical change or redistribution. And it seems to me that Yemen's future depends very much on whether or not these elite rivals and these groups of rival families and business interests are more concerned about the threat posed to one another than they are about redistributing wealth, responding to popular anger, and creating a fairer, more sustainable system that can survive the transition to a post-oil economy. I just talked very briefly about um, the efforts of Western governments to support reform in Yemen over the last 10 years. There's been quite a concerted push, and the British government's played a really strong role in this, in trying to rectify some of the structural economic flaws that might um, put the economy on a more sustainable path. But in Yemen, as elsewhere, there's a tendency to view corruption and, and fragility in local terms, and sometimes regional terms. And the remedies tend to be highly technocratic. But governance reform in Yemen and in, in other fragile states is a highly political process. And successive efforts to promote reform in Yemen have floundered on this question of elite incentives and the absence of elite incentives to, to, to carry out these painful political reforms that would make life much harder in the short term for ordinary Yemenis. Food prices would rise, potentially deal prices, would, diesel prices would rise. But it would also have an impact on the patronage structures that are really holding things together in the absence of a formal state. But the other, the other factor to bear in mind is that not enough attention really has been paid to the, in my mind, to the interplay between domestic and international factors that have incentivized corruption in Yemen. And much of what passed for political economy and political activity in Yemen under the former president really constituted a squabble between these rival factions for a greater share of the economy. And the goal of that competition was profit. Um, but the profits didn't stay in Yemen because these different elite families and groups had their own private banking channels and they were using these banking channels to transfer large amounts of money out, out of the country into much safer jurisdictions, some of which may have been tax havens 
and the impact that this has had on the strength of state institutions, the governance environment, and the security conditions in Yemen, is it has undermined those crucial domestic tax revenues that would be used to build the state. So we see a really destructive cycle where weak institutions, weak property rights, and low growth are, pro are, are providing a push factor, which is encouraging people to send capital flight out of the country into a safer environment, but it's also perpetuating those problems in their own right. Um, okay, Yemen was fifth amongst least developed countries in the 1990s and the 2000s for rates of capital flight. Um, really, that competition began to intensify between elite factions in the late 2000s, and during the 2011 uprising, our research shows that possibly billions were transferred, billions of dollars were transferred out of the country. And that was accentuated by the threat of sanctions, which came from the UN Security Council, in an attempt to cease the fighting between these groups and reach a political solution. Um, you know, to my mind, if these pull factors remain in place, and if the structure of the political economy is not changed, new faces in government, and even potentially new state structures, are unlikely to alter the basic rules of the game of Yemen's political economy. And to that sense, you know, Yemen potentially is a case study for a systemic problem. The 2011 uprising saw youth activists come out onto the streets in their thousands in a rebellion on the part of an entire generation, which is what it seemed at times, against political and economic corruption at the highest level, and a mass outpouring of frustration that was caught by decades of unaccountable rule and economic marginalization. And we've all seen this pattern elsewhere across the Middle East and North Africa during the Arab Spring. But it's also a pattern that's common to people who are working in fragile states. And beyond that, it shares some characteristics with the activists in the um, Western Occupy movement, actually. Because it all comes down to the relationship between the market and the state. Um, and I, I would like to argue that Yemen's uprising forms part of that global discussion about political representation and market forces in the wake of the global financial crisis. I'm going to make some, well, trying to do my best to not agree with two previous uh, speakers. There's, of course, quite a lot you can agree with, but I, I think in terms of leading to what do we do about it and how will things come about and how will change come about, I think I will actually differ here in terms of the views I'm having. And I'll be very careful. I will make sure that I'm very clear when I'm drifting into more personal view of me as an academic and uh, from where, where government may be or where it's going. Okay, so I find this, um, uh, the, the relationship between uh, illicit flows, capital flight, and development is, a, is, is quite a, a tricky one, especially the relation between capital flight and development. Um, the point that I will want to make is that capital flight is a symptom, not a cause. And we have to be very careful that when we try to look for remedies, that we think carefully through what it means to be a symptom. Are we just treating the symptoms, or are we fundamentally dealing with some of the causes uh, around it? Um, there was a time when I was educated as an economist that capital flight was also talked about all the time, uh, as also the, co the, the reason why, for example, Latin America wasn't functioning and where it fundamentally was all you know, a way of arguing against uh, capital account liberalization and free flows of capital, and where, in fact, arguments were all the time made about capital controls as the real thing, because that will make development take place. It's quite an interesting thing, because we've moved a long way. We've moved a long way where there's actually a relative consensus that um, fundamentally, the capital account, we need to be very careful about movements in and out countries that probably, and even almost up to the IMF, there will be voices, not necessarily everybody, but voices recognizing that certain types of quick movements of <coughs> capital over borders are probably not very good for economies in the world economy. Think of deposit flows, uh, people moving very quickly money around. As we've learned probably in the Asian crisis, that can't be very good. But at the same time, coming to a more stronger conviction, that actually flows of capital for investment and repatriation of profit is probably something, it's not the best idea to try to stop this. You know, if we look at structures of African economies, we want to be a bit careful with. And I'm saying this from an economic, economic point of view and not necessarily from, from a political economy point of view and whatever. But the, the debate has moved to something else, to tax havens, to these kind of places. And it's not anymore about can they cross the borders, but where are they going to? And it's quite an interesting thing 
which probably gets already close to that indeed there is probably a more fundamental problem, not so much with controls on borders, because that actually will help that can be positive for countries and blocking that will throw away the, ch the, ch the baby with the bathwater, that you actually focus on that. And you know, uh, the one thing that, uh, and I will add a sentence here, to many of our surprise that the UK government has taken on as the theme of the G8, and I will be very honest about it, and when in DFID, uh, some people, and I dare to mention names of people like Paul Collier, uh, got actually under the skin of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of leading politicians and talked about it, you know, what could we do as the G8? And where the topic, and I remember a couple of years ago when it was put to me, uh, I said, you know, never will, UK will never go for this. Trade, transparency, and, and taxation. Because, okay, because you would thought that that actually a very sensitive battle a very tricky battle, a very messy battle, a very, it's not about just two people go and tango, it's a kind of a really quite a not very attractive Morris dance that would have to be played with lots of players there. So you get in a very strange thing. And indeed, I will be saying, and I will be saying also as, a, as an official within government now, to say, I'm surprised how far we got. And I think it's been a remarkable sense that actually the debate has been opened. We can have a debate, and it's not anymore whether we should start thinking about it, but how and how far will we go? And I think uh, we could be skeptical, but, I can, uh, but, but there is a sense, there is definitely a sense of the, of the progress we've seen, that certain elements are now, can be discussed. And indeed, tax havens can be discussed, we can talk about it. And in fact, some of the things that are in the, in the communique of, uh, of, of the G8, um, the, the communique of the G8 meetings is actually are quite, quite striking by, by emphasizing you know, the sharing of information but also looking for facilities and ways, which means in practice, if you are a government official like me, that actually you have to take, make steps to see what, how far can you get with it, including getting developing countries in, in practical terms, start working with HMRC uh, to try to actually get certain things moving in countries, which, to be honest, five years ago would, be, would, would never be thought about. And similarly, on transparency initiatives, the kind of pressure to go well beyond the Bribery Act with actually looking for transparency and forcing firms to go further, partly shaming firms to do this, partly pushing them and showing that it's in their self-interest to do so. That's something quite. So I think there's an all series of things that are quite positive steps. And I think we can clearly go further, and many of us would like to go further, but that's the thing. But now come to the final point. Is this, how does this solve the case study? How does this solve something? What, will, what traction will we get in terms of places like Yemen? And I would actually argue it will have more traction in the Mozambiques of the world, in the Tanzanias of the world, where the murky world where we're dealing with is slightly less murky than actually going to some of the kind of really extreme rent-seeking states as we can have mm -hmm. states organized around rent-seeking as we would have at Yemen. And then we have to be very careful. When we go in more degrees of fragility, this is not going to solve fragility. Tax havens are not going to solve this. If we think of what are the binding constraints, you know, I was spent a summer in Congo, in DRC, you know, there were always houses in Brussels to be bought. You don't need tax havens to get the houses in Brussels to be bought. You will always be able to get licit, if that's a word, that uh, flows to get out. The state, that is the state that you described, that is organized around rent seeking, will we have ways of organizing legal rent seeking. And in fact, there is a huge amount of legal rent seeking taking place, organized by the most fragile states. So just focusing on solving simply the legality of these flows will, will so basically changing the pool factor. I'm actually quite convinced it is, it is not where the solution lies. The solution lies into the ugly fight, the really difficult fight in development, is engaging with these countries, and even if for 10 years we don't get very far, to try to look for better and better ways of doing it and keep on doing it. Because fundamentally, capital will keep on flying from these places as long as capital has no reason to stay. And the key point here is, that's where the cause is. The capital is going because there's not of anyone's interest to invest it in Yemen. The investment climate and political economy are such that actually productive investment don't make any sense. And that's, then we can go into the political economy interaction between the economy and the politics and, uh, and the rent-seeking structure. That is the only thing. If, as long as that doesn't start changing, we won't get anywhere. There are countries, you know, Latin American countries, where people thought the curse was there, 
there are changes happening, and in fact, more and more reasons for capital to stay in Latin America are there. This is not the debate we're having anymore like we had in the 80s about Latin America. Similarly, there are African countries where investment opportunities arise because investment climates are improving, where bit by bit political economy and transparency uh, starts increasing inside the country. We can have five elections that are run smoothly in Ghana, resulting that actually it's quite an attractive place to invest in. And actually we start getting these things. That is the fight, and I think that is the binding constraint. And I would say, you know, we, we keep on working on some of these pull factors, but we have to be realistic to get some of these places to be sorted out. The solution lies to a strong extent also what, whatever we can achieve in these places. It will be an ugly fight, but it's the fight worth fighting.